Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is June 12th, 2022. This video is called Born of Water. Hebrews 13, 14 says, Here we have no enduring city, but we seek the city that is to come. The name of that city is New Jerusalem. In the... Uh, the book of 1 John, we are told over and over again to love not the world or the things of this world. This world is our womb, but it is now expelling us. And we need to understand that. The world is expelling us. It is actively killing us. And... We need to accept that and we need to be ready for the next phase. What is the next phase? The phase of being born of water. All Christians, all people who have believed in Jesus Christ, truly believed, have been born of the Spirit, but very few have been born of water. Today I'm going to explain what that means. I doubt that I'll get through all of this today, but uh, it is possible. Um, I'd strongly encourage you to go and listen to the last teaching video I did because I talked very much about the whole idea of being born of the Spirit and born of water. Since that time, God has been revealing some things to me from the book of John that have been um, very profound. And so I'm going to go into much greater depth today than what I did in the previous video with respect to certain scriptures. And I think this will make a lot of things clear that may not have been clear in the last video. So uh, get out your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. Paul briefly talks about this idea of being born of water in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, uh, verses 25 through 32. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. That means that he might separate her, uh, bring her apart to make her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word the washing of water with the word. You must understand that phrase or at least have that phrase in your heart and you'll begin to understand it as we go through this teaching. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. <clears throat> Today, the church is not holy. Today, the church is filled with sin, filled with blemish. She is not sanctified. She doesn't even understand anything about being washed with the word. She doesn't understand the word. When the word is taught, she doesn't teach it correctly. Her pastors do not teach it correctly. And most people in the church do not learn for themselves how to discern the Word of God, how to get water for themselves. They, they expect someone else to give them their water. And that has to change. It has to change now or you will not have the oil you need when the time comes to go into the wedding supper of the Lamb. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound the mystery of the two becoming one flesh. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Paul uses 
this word that a husband and wife are to become one flesh, but he's saying the reality of that, which goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, is that it refers to Christ and the church, or Christ and his bride. So, a man shall leave his father and mother. So, applying that to Christ, that's saying Christ shall leave his father and mother. He shall leave his father. He always talked about the father. And hold fast to his wife, the bride of Christ. And the two shall become one flesh. This is where the church will not go, and they're afraid to go here. Because it says you are going to be like Christ. You're going to be one flesh with him. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Let's turn to John chapter 1. I'm not going to read every verse from the book of John, but I'm going to read quite a few, and I'm going to start with the first 17, 18 verses that are critical. This is so essential for anyone. Any Christian should really know this by heart. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him, in the word, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. <clears throat> the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, that is, to the Jews, because Jesus himself was born of the Jews. He was born of Mary. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Have you received him? Have you believed in his name? Then you have the right to become a child of God. Does it mean you will become one? <clears throat> Unfortunately, most people die without ever understanding what these words mean. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So born of God. Here is the first mention of that in this book. And it's what Jesus talks to Nicodemus about in chapter 3. And then the famous verse that most Christians at least have heard this. <clears throat> verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him, John the Baptist, and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. John physically was born before Jesus, six months before Jesus, but Jesus was before John because Jesus is John's creator. Verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, as great as that is, and it is great. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Most people did not learn grace through the law, even though there is grace in the law. The law is truth. 
So Jesus came to explain the law, to perfect the law, to bring it to completion. And the scripture in verse 17 says grace and truth. So grace and the law came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, that's Jesus. He has made him known. So no one has ever seen God, the Father. Every time someone has seen God, <clears throat> they've seen Jesus. Jesus came and always appeared as the Son of Man or the Angel of the Lord or something like that. So in the scripture, you do have appearances of God, but it's, a, it's the physical appearance of the Son of Man. It's a, the, the physical appearance of Jesus who appeared in the flesh so that men could look upon him. But yet there was something about him that they knew that it was God because you look at what happens when he appears to Abraham, for example. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to Go down and read, we'll read verses 29 to 34. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the Passover Lamb, and when we believe upon him, when we believe in his blood, it's just like the Israelites when they, when they put the blood on their doors. <clears throat> the Passover, the death angel passed over them and did not kill them. So Jesus is the Passover lamb. Behold the Passover lamb, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. <clears throat> and John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. We baptize with water because it symbolizes what Jesus is, who he is, and what he does with us. <clears throat> the mere fact that you're baptized in water doesn't mean anything. You do it in obedience, that means something. To do anything in obedience to the scripture means something, of course. But baptism itself the, the act of baptism is not what saves you. What saves you is the reality of the water that it symbolizes. That's how you will enter into the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to begin to understand today. <clears throat> Now we're going to go ahead and skip to chapter 2. And I th it's so profound. See, this is the first miracle that Jesus does. Starts in verse 1 on the third day. The third day because it is the, the prophetic day of our resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. We will be raised from the dead on the third day when we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, when our flesh is glorified. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, 
<clears throat> each holding 20 or 30 measures. Six stone water jars, that represents man. Man was created on the sixth day. The number of man is 666. Man is the beast that we see in the book of Revelation. Jesus died for the beast. Jesus was put into a feeding trough when he was born because he is food for the beasts. And we are those beasts that he is, he is the food for. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So here we have water. These six jars, which represent men <clears throat> or man, man is to be filled with water. We are to be washed with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, Everyone who serves the good wine, everyone else serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory as disciples believed in him. <clears throat> this represents the glorification of men who have filled themselves with water. It represents the fullness of the Spirit. So wine here represents the Spirit. It represents the good Spirit. But there is wine that is the bad Spirit. False doctrine, false spirits. But there is good wine, and we are to become good wine. The water in us is to become living water. It's to become spiritual wine that will literally bring life to other people. When we speak, we should speak the very words of God so that our words bring life. Now let's go to John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, <clears throat> Truly, truly, or amen, amen. I speak the truth. I speak the truth. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, true, truly, truly, or amen, amen, or the truth, the truth, I say to you. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We see the kingdom of God when we're born of the Spirit, <clears throat> when we're born again. We cannot enter the kingdom of God. We cannot enter New Jerusalem until we're born of water. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. Now I have actually heard Bible teachers say that what Jesus is saying here is that um, every natural person is born of water. You know, when you're born, your mother's water breaks and then you're born. And then it's only the people who are born of the spirit who are born again. Totally wrong. It's not at all talking about the natural birth where the waters of a woman break. <clears throat> We are to be born of water, and we need to understand what that means. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So we're all born of the flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
Our spirit's food is water. It's the water of the word. Most Christians are malnourished. Most Christians only receive milk and they never receive the water of the word. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Pastor, are you the teacher of Christians and you do not understand these things? Husband, are you the teacher of your wife and you do not understand these things? Father, are you the teacher of your children and you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, <clears throat> amen, amen. I say to you, we speak what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Who receives our testimony? If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe it if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You should look this up in the book of Numbers, just as people had to look up to the serpent on the stick to be to live, to be saved, then people need to look up to Jesus on the cross to be saved now. And then they need to begin to wash themselves with the word. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the world, the world that John says in 1 John, love not the world. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's the whole purpose Christ came. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that, he, so that it may clearly be seen that his works have been carried out in God. <clears throat> Now we're going to go to John chapter 4. What I'm focusing on in the book of John is how you see this progression. First, Jesus is introduced as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we're introduced to the Word, the Word, okay? Now, I read to you Ephesians, where he talks about the washing of water with the Word, okay? Second chapter of John talks about changing the water to wine. So we have this chapter one focus on the Word, Chapter 2, a focus on the water. Chapter 3, with Nicodemus, you must be born of water and the Spirit. And now here we are in chapter 4, and look at this. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, 
near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. <clears throat> so it's about noontime. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Here's water again. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They were prejudiced. They wanted to stay clean. See, they couldn't get unclean, they thought. Jesus answered her. Jesus was not afraid of getting unclean, was he? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water... That means the water from the well, natural water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. How is it you could never be thirsty again? It's because you have found the truth. You have found what is real. You don't need to go elsewhere. You don't need to keep looking for truth somewhere else because this is the truth. So we learn to drink the water that is Christ and we are never thirsty again because there's nowhere else to go. Where would we go? Where else could we go for the truth? The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. <clears throat> the water that Jesus gives us becomes in us a well of water, a spring of water. Here in Missouri where I am, I'm around many natural springs. And it's amazing. They're, they're constantly running and they're running. Many of them gush forth 80 million gallons of water a day or more, some more than that. The eighth largest spring in Missouri produces over 80 million dollars or 80 million gallons of water a day. That's my favorite spring in Missouri. It's called Blue Spring. And it's really profound. So a spring is always producing water. You're always seeing water come out of the spring. Well, that is supposed to be like us. We should always have fresh water coming out of us so that we have something to share with those who are in need. Our own spirits should be producing fresh water daily. So within us, we have a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And it's not only for us, it's for other people as well. So here we are now in John chapter 4. In every single chapter, we now have seen the relationship of the word to the water. Then in chapter 5, we have the healing at the pool on the Sabbath. Verse uh, 1, after this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, 
which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. So here we, we again have a reference to water. Jesus said to him, Take up, get up, take up your bed and walk. Okay, Jesus is speaking to him. His speaking the word is as the speaking or the washing of water. And so Jesus now is washing this man with water. His words have healing in them, and he tells the man to get up and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. The reality is that when, when our water is turned into wine, when the glorification occurs, we also will speak like Jesus did, and we will have power just like Jesus had, and we'll know when to use it and when not to use it. And then when we speak, it will be the washing of water by the word. The rest of that chapter is very interesting and it deals with Jesus only doing what he sees his father doing and only saying what his father would say, which is very important and it's what we need to walk in as well. Well, I'm going to go ahead and read some of this because it does relate to what we're talking about. Verse 19 in chapter 5. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, or Amen, Amen, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Son raises the dead as well. We're dead in our sins until we believe in Jesus. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Amen, amen. Or truth, truth, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. This is how we know if we have passed from death to life that we have heard Christ's word and that we have believed in him. We know that we have eternal life. We have passed from death to life. Truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So Jesus, because he is a man, he was a man, he has the authority to judge men. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. <clears throat> and 
And I want to quickly read another verse here before we go to chapter 6. 43, 543 says this, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? This is how you know the true prophet from the false prophet, the true teacher from the false teacher. The false teacher comes in his own name and tries to make a name for himself and tries to sell his product and sell his wares and become famous uh, and does things in order to become popular and to and to look cool and to be famous. Has his own ministry. Um, does a person come in his own name or does he come in the name of the Son of God, in the name of Jesus? Jesus came in his Father's name. I come in the name of Jesus because Jesus is my Father. And now Jesus feeds the 5,000. We're, we're at chapter 6, John chap, chapter 6. I've decided I'm going to go ahead and end this video today. And we'll begin again with chapter 6 when I resume this study called Born of Water. There's much for us to learn here. The time is short. I do not know how much time we have left. 